Okay. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to be back with you. I had the opportunity of um, camping with 100 women last weekend in Big Sur. And I will tell you, uh, there is something really, really magical <laughs> about Big Sur. It is sacred ground. And there's also something magical about going to sleep next to the river and waking up next to the river and just being in that peaceful surrounding of nature. And then it was really good to be back in my bed. <laughs> so <laughs> and there goes our, uh, thank you, good job. <laughs> we, we, uh, we have a little reminder that goes off at 10.48 every morning. <laughs> so thank you, Mary, for taking care of that. Um, so let me start officially by saying Grand Rising. And that is the theme for 2024 for Centers for Spiritual Living, communities like ours all across the country, in the Canada, in the Mexico, and around the world. And we are looking at this idea, this beautiful uh, Caribbean idea of grand rising. It is a salutation that is used by uh, individuals who really invite us to rise greatly in the morning, to meet the day with energy and enthusiasm and encouragement. And all year we've been looking at different topics that can um, connect us with this idea of rising grandly. And today we are, t um, and all month for the month of September, we're looking at pieces into peace pieces into peace. And all that means is that oftentimes we see life in its different component parts, in pieces, right? We see our, we compartmentalize our lives. We, we, and sometimes those pieces aren't congruent or coherent and they, or they seem disparate. And so the topic all month is looking at how we take the pieces of our lives and our world and bring them into a deeper sense of peace. And today the topic is imagine peace. In week one, we looked at peace as we individuate it within ourselves. We looked at this idea that peace is an inside job, that there's something that we do within ourselves to, I think the batteries might, could, we, could I ask you to advance the slide? Because my, there we go. So in week one, we looked at inner peace. We looked at that idea of rising from the pieces of our lives, the, the places where we compartmentalize into that central place within ourselves so that we could tap into inner peace. And then in week two, we looked at our interpersonal lives and the peace that we could find with each other. I shared some stories about the transition I made to a more peaceful and loving relationship with family. And we, I, we talked about that ability to wake up to a bigger idea and to, to recognize that we are often in a place of projection when we are in relationship with someone else. We are often looking through that our own lens. And so we, we looked at that in week two and then last week, Reverend Karen did an expert job of marrying music and the spoken word to talk about community and sangha and how we can create a community that reflects peace back to us. And so this week, we're going to look at this idea of imagining peace and beginning to really create that solid intention for world peace. It seems like forever that we have been imagining peace, doesn't it? And it seems like forever that we keep finding different areas of the world at odds with each other, at war with each other. I find it hard to believe that in 2024 there are still places in the world where people are killing each other because they believe differently because they believe differently. Our 
vision in Centers for Spiritual Living is a world that works for all. And when we begin to walk that out through our practices and our principles, it requires us to really be awake to that idea, to step back, to be conscious, to be intentional. Did you know that every September, the United Nations designates an International Day of Peace? And that day was yesterday. And each year they pick a theme for really diving deep into that idea of peace. And this year's theme was cultivating a culture of peace. And so they, they write on their website, we cultivate a culture of peace which draws inspiration in the belief that wars begin in the minds of humans. Sound familiar? Certainly we talk about that everything is created twice, first in consciousness and then in form. And so the United Nations is right on par with the philosophy that we teach. They go on to say that cultivating peace means instilling values of dialogue and mutual respect at a young age. Dialogue and mutual respect. When I look around, I, I see a lot of examples of what that doesn't look like. <laughs> I see a lot of examples of people who aren't seeing each other, of people who aren't hearing each other, of people who are so invested in what they believe that it seems to wash over anything else. And while I respect the passion that people have for their ideas, I think that this idea of peace really calls to us to come to a place where we can pause and can really see each other. Because in this world of ours, it is so easy to dehumanize each other, to sit there behind my phone or my computer and spout off things without really recognizing where the other person is, without really seeing them, without really hearing them. And it, it reminds me of this story um, in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I know it's an oldie but goodie, but I'm going to tell it if you've heard it before. I mean, it still moves me. And so Stephen Covey tells this well-known story about an incident in the subway. And I'm going to read it to you because it's so eloquent the way he writes it. Stephen writes, I was riding a subway on Sunday morning in New York and people were sitting quietly reading papers or resting with their eyes closed. It was a peaceful scene. Then a man and his children entered the subway car. The man sat next to me and closed his eyes, apparently oblivious to his children who were yelling and throwing things and even grabbing people's papers. I couldn't believe he could be so insensitive. Eventually, with what I felt was unusual patience, I turned and said, Sir, your children are disturbing people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a little bit. The man lifted his gaze as he saw the situation for the first time, as if he wasn't even there or hearing what they were doing. And he said softly, Oh, you're right. I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. I don't know what to think, and I guess they don't know how to handle it either. And suddenly, I saw things differently. And because I saw things differently, I felt differently, and I behaved differently, and my irritation vanished. I didn't have to worry about controlling my attitude or my behavior. My heart filled with compassion your wife just died? Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you tell me about it? What can I do to help? Everything changed in that instant. Much of what Stephen Covey taught in his uh, well-known series of highly, you know, teaching effective effectiveness and being su successful was this core idea that it is better to understand 
than to be understood. That it's better to understand than to be understood. And it is our judgments about people and the reasons for their behavior that we get tripped up with. We're not, it's not always obvious why people behave the way that they do. It's not always obvious why people cling to an idea. And so as we talk about this idea of world peace that begins with us, that moves into our interpersonal relationships, that moves into our community and out into the world, it requires that we recognize our own lens. How are we seeing the world? How are we, what is the, the collection of ideas and thoughts and behaviors and values that we're looking through when we're looking at each other? And so this, this story is, is so powerful and potent and obvious. I know that anyone in this room who was in that same situation, who happened to lean over and talk to that man, would have reacted the same way with great compassion and care and wanting to help. But sometimes our challenges are, are more subtle. They're not quite as obvious. And it's, it's ours to do as conscious individuals, as individual individuals who have made a commitment to living spiritually, it is ours to be available to, to the moment. Because sometimes the person that you might be angry with or the person who might be spouting off the details of their latest diatribe of political nomenclature. <laughs> I was going to say nonsense. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes that's a safety valve for somebody. That's a place where they can feel safe because something else is happening for them. And we don't always know what that is. We don't always know what the, the subtleness is. And so in order for us to really engage a mindset of peace, we need to engage some skills around that. And some of those skills are really obvious. Being kind. Don't you love those bumper stickers on the, that you see when you're driving down the road that say, be kind? They don't say, be nice. So I've seen a couple be nice, but there's a distinct difference between kindness and niceness. Stephen Covey, when he leaned over to get this guy to take care of his kids, was being polite. He was being nice. He was motivated by uh, addressing conflict and trying to, you know, smooth it down. But once he found out what was going on with that person, kindness kicked in. Kindness is that ability for us to really step in to be empathetic and compassionate and to really care about somebody and want to help them with the situation that they're in. And so as we look for this idea of a pathway to peace, I think it's important for us to recognize as we're, as we're being conscious, as we're moving towards peace, as we're trying to create more peace, the we're not talking about putting a lid on something, right? Sometimes we think that peace is making the conflict go away for now, for a moment, for a week, for maybe a, a couple of weeks or a month. In this moment, it occurs to me that that's what's been happening in the Middle East. For as long as I can remember, there has been conflict in the Middle East. And we've made nice for years. A year or two here, a year or two there. Maybe a, a longer period of time. But that conflict continues to bubble up because healing has not happened there. And so when we talk about um, creating peace and that pathway to peace, it's not about putting a lid on something. It's about really being available to the moment. Um, as I was putting together my ideas for this talk, it occurred to me that our human experience is actually the pathway to peace and not the obstacle that we often think it is. 
that it is this human experience, this messy experience of stepping on each other's toes and having differences of opinion and seeing each other through our own lens, that is the pathway to peace. That is where we begin to walk consciously and awaken ourselves to what it is that wants to be healed, what's below the surface that wants to come up and be known by us so that we can really experience peace. I liken that to the pathway of our philosophy in Centers for Spiritual Living. We are a philosophy that is in its infancy, if you will. We're just barely 100 years old. And we started in this philosophy in a, um, uh, a, a way of helping individuals to become more conscious so that they could, they could master their own lives, so that they could be uh, more highly functional and that they could be more successful in their relationships and with their finances. And, and all of those things are really wonderful. But as our movement has matured, it has come time for us as individuals, as um, spiritual livers, if you will, that it, it is time for us to express that in the circles of influence around us, to bring those skills to those, to our families, to our social circles, to our larger communities, so that we can really experience peace, so that we can really experience healing. Centers for Spiritual Living, we always talk about it's the global vision of a world that works for everyone, but we don't always talk about the mission and the purpose our purpose as a global organization is to awaken humanity to its spiritual magnificence. And our mission is to provide spiritual tools for personal and global transformation. So if we are going to have this experience of personal and global transformation, that means walk in our talk. That means practice. That means taking classes, coming to a center like this where you can be in community, doing the things that help to keep us awake so that when we're sitting next to somebody who's irritating us, we can pause for a moment and remember that that's another human being and we don't know what they're going through. We, we don't know what's happening in their world. And there's this sweet spot of self-care and caring for ourselves and loving our neighbor and walking these principles out into the world and dealing with what I'll call our abusive people. There's this, 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 um, it's kind of like a, an art, right? It's an art to be able to know where you are, to locate yourself. And that starts with us knowing and being grounded in our inner peace so that we can recognize the situation we find ourselves in. Is this some place where I can be effective? Is this some place where I can be part of the solution? Is this some place where I just need to bless that person and move on? I can tell you where, where it's not. It's not a place for us to, to continue to agitate, to insist on being right to uh, create, to look at people through our judgment and our lens and, and not to be willing to, th to see that there might be a bigger picture here. I was really pleased on Friday morning, our global organization did a whole day of prayer. They called it a prayer-a-thon around peace. And so that we spent about two hours online with practitioners and ministers and musicians weaving in prayer and practice so that we could focus on peace, so that we could really uh, do that in inner reflection about what it is that needs to come bubbling up within ourselves so that we could be part of the solution of creating a world that works for all and part of beginning to imagine and see uh, a world that is at peace. 
The other thing that um, spiritual tool that Centers for Spiritual Living is offering is a, a book study online. It'll start Wednesday night, and we'll be studying this book, What It Takes to Heal, How Transforming Ourselves Can Change the World. And it's written by a very insightful uh, social worker, psychologist, and I want to read a little bit about what she says about healing. For a long time, I searched for a definition of healing. Most times, what I came across in the world of psychology was the treatment of symptoms, not the root cause. Or healing is defined by the ability to get back in the saddle and become a more productive citizen. In other circles, healing was an escape, a disengagement from life, high-end retreats and self-care classes where you could pay for temporary relief from your messy problems and leave the outside world at bay. Most of the time, we define terms according to our context, so it's not surprising that our terms for healing reflect the destructive, individualistic, and productivity-oriented tendencies of our societies. She's talking about this this cultural thing we have to get her done, to get through it, to march ahead. Sometimes when the proverbial shite hits the fan, <laughs> it's cause to pause. It's cause to see what is it that is calling my attention. Is there something here that needs to be healed? I love she, she comes to this place, she says, I have been working for years now trying to come up with my own definition for healing. And so she writes, healing is the process, often lifelong, of restoring and reawakening the capacities for safety, belonging, and dignity on the other side of our traumas. And trauma's a buzzword, and we think of trauma as that person who, you know, maybe they, someone was murdered before them, some terrible, horrific thing that happened. But traumas are simple things like you lose a job and your whole world shifts, or you suddenly, you know, have to move because you can't afford where you're living, or perhaps your partner decides they want to be with someone else. Trauma happens when we don't feel safe, when we don't feel like we belong, and when we feel like we're disconnected. And so healing is restoring that. And, and that is the pathway to peace. When we look at this idea of peace, it is really about coming to that place of healing those things that keep bubbling up, that we keep pushing down. You know, in the 1500s, during the Spanish Inquisition, Everybody on the, in that area deserved the label of li living through trauma. It was truly a traumatic time in the world. And yet there were beautiful mystics that knew how to come to a place of peace and to walk forward from that place. And they, and they shared wisdom with us that is still true today and the one mystic that I'm thinking of is St. Francis of Assisi. He, uh, his whole ministry was about peace. His whole ministry was about caring for the world around him, finding that place of belonging and safety for individuals. And he wrote this beautiful prayer. And, um, and I thought as we sort of wrapped up today's talk as we wrapped up this section of our time together that I would invite you to imagine peace and to imagine this prayer that I have updated a little <laughs> for a, a pathway that you can follow to really be generative in creating peace in your world. And so I invite you to get comfortable Maybe close your eyes and take in these words as I speak them. And this will be how I, I end our talk this morning instead of prayer. I'll use St. Francis's prayer or the peace prayer as it's known.
So taking a deep breath, take these words as your own. Divine Spirit, I am an instrument of peace. Where there is hatred, I sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine One, know that I am here on the planet not to be consoled as to console, not to be understood as to understand, not to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. And it is in forgiveness that we are forgiven. And it is in living a life of peace and love now that we experience eternal life in this now moment and forevermore. And so it is. Thank you very much.